Blog Talk Radio. Mi chiamo Apura Kanu, Apura Kai Knut, Neye Eguada, Medinde Ujira for Kwesi Rane Mbuta Akan, Akwamuma and Maruka, Etipi Mu Ujira for Ujira Mai Mu. Greetings to all Apura Kani, Apura Kai Knut, people, many Africans, black people today. is Eguade Marketplace Day. My name is Ujira for Kwesi Rane Mbuta Akan, Ujira for the Akwamu Nation in North America. Within Ojirama, the purified nation, Apurakani, Apuraikaitni people in the Western Hemisphere. Yet I say we thank you once again for tuning into the broadcast. Uh, we've opened up the chat room. If you have any questions or comments and you'd like to interact in the chat room, you, can, uh, you must sign in as a user in order to interact. If you don't have a username, you can sign up for one quickly in Blog Talk so you can interact. If you have a question or a comment on the phone line, simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised. We're going to place uh, links in the chat room so that you can get the information right now. For those who are new to the broadcast, we have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akan for Nanasom, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestry Religion on Joda on Monday nights where we deal specifically with the Akan expression of ancestry religion from its authentic context, first and foremost, because we are Akan. Secondly, because of the misinformation being propagated regarding Akan ancestry religion, culture, philosophy, ritual practice, cosmology, and so forth, not only from individuals in the Western Hemisphere, but also from individuals on the continent of Afuraka, Afurakaid, who have been infected with white pseudo-religion, inclusive of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Taoism, Jainism, Buddhism, and so forth, white culture in general. So therefore, those who have been infected with white culture, those infections manifest in their presentation of Akan culture. So we deal specifically with ancient, authentic Akan ancestry religion, Akanfo Nanasom, which deals with our ancestral origins in ancient Kanat, the Khan land, which is the title of ancient Nubia, our people originated in those regions, migrated west after the fall of Kemet and northern Kanak 2,000 years ago, reestablished ourselves in the western part of the continent of Afraka, Afraika, Africa, reestablished the Kanak Empire, the Nubian Empire, the Empire of Ghana, and continued civilization. A thousand years later, our people migrated from those regions because of the Muslim invasions, we migrated further south towards the regions of contemporary Ivory Coast and Ghana and reestablished Akana or Akan civilization in the forest belt and savannah regions. Hundreds of years later, some of our people were taken from those regions and forced into the Western Hemisphere, North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musuo Kessie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. However, we maintained our ancestral religious traditions. Thus, the Akan ancestral religion is called Winti in South America, in Suriname, from the Akan term, Queen T. Akan ancestry religion is called Obia in Jamaica from the Akan term, Obai. Akan ancestry religion is called Hudu in North America from the Akan term, Undu, meaning medicine from roots, trees, plant life, root work, and so forth. It also means to become heavy with the spirit, bringing the spirits down through spirit possession and spirit communication. Those definitions also exist in the language of ancient commandments found in the Medu to the hieroglyphs, undu meaning medicine from roots, trees, plant life, undu also meaning to be he- become heavy with the spirit. It also means the ritual offerings, the undu placed on the altar, which is called the undu as well, and there are deities called the undu, the people also called the undu people, the land itself, one of the titles of ancient Nubia is called the undu land. The people are called the Undu people and so forth. So we've been using these terms for thousands of years from ancient Afuraka Afraikai to West Afuraka Afraikai into North America. We also use the term Kanje or Kanjur coming from the Akan term Kanche, meaning to utter incantations to bring down the spirits, bring them forth. That same terminology can be found in the Medu to the hieroglyphs as well. So we deal with ancient authentic Akan ancestral religion on Joda on Monday nights on Abinada, Abinada, Tuesday nights we have Ojira, which means purification, 
we deal with the purification of culture, concepts, cosmology, not just the Akan ancestry religion, but Afro-Akani, Afro-Akani, or African ancestry religion, no matter what form it takes, wherever we exist in the world, and how it impacts every aspect of our lives as Afro-Akani, Afro-Akani people. So when we talk about ancestry religion or Nana Som and purification, we talk about the reality and the definition of ancestry religion, Afurakani, Afurakani, or African ancestry religion, no matter what form it takes, wherever we exist in the world, in essence, is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. That means through ritual we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order and through ritual We reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our lives, to our thoughts, intentions, and actions. Thus, the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance, these are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. We state that ojira, purification, operationalizes nanasom, purification, operationalizes our practice of ritually incorporating law and ritually restoring balance so that we can engage our culture, our way of life, which is the divine law or love of order and the divine rejection, the hatred of disorder, the acceptance of order, the rejection of disorder, and its prevails. That is our way of life. As Afurakani, Afurakani people, we seek to align every thought, intention, and action with divine order every moment of every day. When we make legitimate mistakes, then we engage the ritual process to incorporate law and restore balance so that we can realign our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order every moment of every day and continue to execute our function in creation. So this is how ancestral religion impacts every aspect of our lives. Purification operationalizes that process. So we deal with the purification of cosmology, the purification of concepts, the purification of the knowledge of ancestral religious practice and so forth, inclusive of how it has been maintained in our blood circles intergenerationally and transcarnationally through successive reincarnations since we've been forced into the Western Hemisphere. Therefore, we maintain these traditions and powered and guided by these ancestral religious traditions. We wage war against the whites and their offspring, forcing the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere, raising up metal armaments to wage war, as well as chemical and biological warfare, root work being the precedent established by our people for chemical and biological warfare being waged in the Western Hemisphere. So, and of course we have that legacy to build on today, and we are building on that today. So that's what we deal with on that broadcast. On Yada Thursday nights, also called Yada Abada, we have Amain Sim Affairs of the Nation. We deal with specific issues that are confronting us as Afurakani, Afurakani people, as an Omain, as a nation specifically, Ojira Man, the purified Ojira, Omain nation, Omain land of the West, the setting sun. So Ojira Man, in the language of ancient Kemet, as well as the Akan language, means the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. When we understand what an Omain, a nation, actually is, we approach our problems, our issues, and solve them from an Amaniye perspective or a nationist perspective. We deal with nationism, Amaniye, the purification of nationalism. Nationism recognizing an Oman, a nation is a living, breathing entity governed by specific Abosom, Orisha, Vodou, and so forth, just like an organ is an entity governed by specific forces in creation. The cells of the organ are children of the organ. They work interdependently with regard to one another, but they also work to support the greater parent organ of which they are a component part and the energy complex that governs that organ. So when we naturally understand that reality, we were forced into the Western Hemisphere. However, we were guided by our ancestresses and ancestors to coalesce in a specific region of the Western Hemisphere, of the specific region of the Earth Mother's body in the West, blend ancestral blood circles, bring ancestresses and ancestors back through these blended ancestral blood circles, interface with the earth mother divinities in this region of their body in the West, interface with the plant-like, animal-like, mineral-like for food as well as medicine in this region of the West and those animal totems 
mineral totems, plant totems, and so forth, spiritually in the West, interface with the unique expression of the Abosom, the Orisha, the Vodou, the deities, spirit forces in creation as they manifest in the Western region of the Earth Mother's body. That confluence of experience and events allowed us to forge a locative identity based on the blending of ancestral blood circles in this region of the Earth Mother's body and all its implications. And therefore, we have a unique expression of ancestral religion, practice, Afurakani, Afurakani culture, and a unique approach to solving our issues based on who we are as a unique group of Afurakani, Afurakani people here in the Western Hemisphere. So we have an Amanie approach, a nationist approach. We deal with nationism, the purification of nationalism, a holistic approach to nation building. So we deal with that on Amain Sim Affairs with Nation Day. And of course, today is Egua Day, Marketplace Day. We showcase Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions, those who are serving the Afurakani, Afurakani community in a positive capacity, those who maintain their ancestral religious values in the context of their service to the community. We also deal with the philosophical foundation of economic development rooted in our ancestral religious values. We have thus uh, published the Okom Economic Development Model. It is an approach to economic development which is holistic because it's rooted in our ancestral religious values. And part of the operation with regard to the Okom Economic Development Model, and you can download that for free on our website, of course, part of that operation is what we call starve the beast and feed the pride. That means we make a, um, a decision, we make an assessment on a weekly basis to determine what funds we would have potentially wasted with the whites in their offspring, and then we starve the beast and feed the pride. We take those funds we would have wasted with the whites in their offspring and redirect them to the business organization or institution of the week. We target one Afurakani, Afurakani business organization or institution per week for optimal capital infusion. Thus, when you take $10 you would have wasted at a white business like CVS or 7-Eleven or Chipotle or whatever in the course of a week, and you re redirect that $10 to the business organization or institution of the week, that's a transfer of $10 of capital from a white organization to a black organization. When a thousand of our people engage that process of starving the beast and feeding the pride, then that's $10,000 transferred in the course of seven days from white businesses to a business, an Afurakani or Afurakani business organization or institution. When they receive $10,000 in the course of a week, they are able to hire permanently employees from within the community immediately in the course of a week. They're able to expand their product lines and services to us so that we don't have to go outside of our community for those same products and services. It's a win-win situation across the board. If we do not engage that process, then by default, we are leaving that $10,000 in the hands of our absolute enemies, the whites and their offspring. And by default, we are financing our own oppression. We're receiving over $1 trillion through our hands in the course of a year, spending power, and we've been spending over 95% of that $950 billion plus with the whites in their offspring, and then the other 5% we're only spending within our community. We can transfer and leave another 20% of that back into our community. We're spending about $20 billion per week just on a regular basis. If we spent 10% of that to 10% of that $20 billion we spend per week, transferred it back to black businesses instead of spending 95 plus percent of it with white businesses, if we took 10% of that $20 billion per week, that's $2 billion a week that we're transferring, plugging into the black community. 10% of whatever you spend, if you redirect that 10% deliberately to black businesses, organizations, and institutions, We'll be able to hire all of the 2 million unemployed black people overnight, literally, permanently, simply by redirecting the funds we're already spending with the whites in their offspring, primarily redirecting them in a conscious, deliberate effort, seeking out 
black businesses, organizations, and institutions and patronizing them, recognizing what funds we would have wasted with the whites and their offspring and redirecting them. There's been over $700 million, for example, spent on the movie Black Panther, for example, and hundreds of millions of those dollars coming from black people. If we spent $300 million over the course of a few weeks on a movie about fictional cartoon characters manufactured by the whites and their offspring, used to promote a white agenda, the white savior agenda, promoting dissexuality, homosexuality, as we talked about, which is coming in the, in the next film and so forth, that homosexual scene, dissexual scene, the lesbian scene was actually filmed, but then they left it on the cutting room floor so it can be set up and fully developed as a relationship in the blockbuster sequel that millions of people they hope of our people will go and see and so forth. They denigrated pan-Africanism, revolutionary, resolutionary action, demonized it so that any black person seeing that movie from that point on, if they hear anybody talking about revolution, resolution, pan-Africanism, self-reliance, independence, and so forth, they will think about the demonized character and shun that idea and embrace the integrationist, embrace the white savior, embrace the nonsense of this sexuality, homosexuality. We paid over $300 million for that, and that's still climbing. Imagine if we took that $300 million we wasted on a movie produced by the whites and their offspring and gave that $300 million to 300 independent black schools that already exist in America. That means 300 black schools would have received $1 million each. If 300 black schools receive $1 million each, they will be able to expand their programs, expand their enrollment, and capture every black child who wanted to go to an independent black school. But instead of being able to educate millions of our children, we simply gave the $300 million to the crack for nothing. So we need to wake up, make a conscious, deliberate effort to redirect our funds that we are already spending with whites and offspring, redirect them to the business organization or institution of the week. That's part of the Ocon economic development model, starve the beast and feed the proud. So what we have today is our sister, Afia Asase Brituo. She is the owner of Hoodoo Pharmacy and Conjure Culture and Couture, um, a, many, many different products and services and so forth. So we want to bring her on. We put the link in the chat room, and we'll make sure that link is up there, asaseyeduru.wixsite.com slash creation slash hoodoo dash pharmacy. So we put that link in the chat room. And we want to bring our sister on right now. Hold on one second. Okay, Michiawo. Afia, can you hear me? Yes, Michiawo. What's up? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm really excited to um, to be on the program. I'm just so grateful and thankful to be able to share um, my journey and um, just honored. I'm feeling good. Well, we want to say, Yeda, I said we appreciate you. We're honored to have you on, honored that you will come on and legitimize our show. So <laughs> um, first and foremost, so who do pharmacy? And, and we have, you know, we have the, the quote. In fact, we have the quote on the website and you talk about hoodoo is in our blood, and you, the name of the business is Hoodoo Pharmacy. So mm-hmm. first, where does, where does, what's the basis of the terminology? Why are you using Hoodoo Pharmacy for the people who are, who are unfamiliar? And by the way, for the people who do not know, we've had our Hoodoo Mind, Hoodoo Nation Festival in October, and this, this, this past October was our third annual, and even at the second annual, Athea presented um, at the second festival as well as the third annual festival, Hoodoo, Mind Nation, Hoodoo Nation Festival here in Washington, D.C. So, um, but for, for the people who are unfamiliar, 
what is Hoodoo Pharmacy about? Well, Hoodoo Pharmacy um, is is an evolution um, because originally, um, as I was developing and growing in my own understanding of returning and sankofing, um, the company was called Enchanted Pharmacy. Um, pharmacy being one of the key words at that time because understanding that the earth, um, all of the medicines that the earth has available to us is a pharmacy. You know, we think of healing, we've been conditioned to think of healing as a pharmacy in terms of the medical establishment, but um, the farm or the earth is really where we get our medicine from, is where we get our indu from. Um, So as I have grown um, and my understanding has changed, the name has changed from enchanted pharmacy to hoodoo pharmacy because of what medicine is, as I now understand, in terms of indu, which is our hoodoo, which is our culture, um, which is in our blood, which is, you know, part of our our birthright, we each come in with a legacy um, that's in our blood from our Nananomen Samanfo. So that's just a, a, a simple or basic understanding of the term voodoo pharmacy and, and where it comes from. It's a lifestyle. Okay, and, and when people... Absolutely. And when people see the site, you, you'll see that it's spelled pharmacy with F-A-R-M, farm, so it's directly, of course, related to the, the land, the fertility, medicine, and so forth. So, and you'll also see it's a very, very beautiful site, very ornate, very Afia-esque, you know, <laughs> very... Meta <laughs> essay. I mean, it, I mean, it's unusually beautiful. So, um, so you have a number of different products. I want to start at the top, but before, before we get to the top, I want to start to talk about the Asuman. That's the first thing people will see on the website, the Asuman, talismans, amulets. But before we get to that, um, just talking about just your journey a little bit, how did you come into um, engaging the practice of ancestral religion? How did that begin? Okay. Well, in in January of 2015, um, you know, I came into – I was brought to the attention of your site, of judifo.com, and for years I had been – uh, seeking answers, I had questions. So like many of us, you know, my journey has not been a straight line. Um, I was drawn to different things, or bits and pieces of things that felt like they were true or that resonated in my soul, but it wasn't holistic, it wasn't complete. And a lot of it, honestly, was definitely not African, as we know, because of how everything is so um, bastardized and mixed up. So in 2015, um, after going through um, a healing trauma, I'll call it, um, I I was pregnant with Abiji with twins, and that experience, um, you know, led me to investigate what does that even mean to carry twins, to carry Abiji, to carry life, um, and I miscarried. So out of that trauma and having to do the ritual and root work to understand what happened, um, why did that occur, what was it, where was I in my life for that occur, and understanding how my ans- my children then became my ancestors, and doing research in my soul work and connecting with my ancestry, I was led to your site. Um, and it just kind of it resonated so strongly with what I had been looking for. And that's kind of, you know, that's like the beginning of the journey as it be- began to be more harmonized and more on a straight and narrow path, if you will. Um, so from discovering and understanding the terms and doing the research and listening to broadcasts and, and doing my ritual work at my Nkomre, you know, crying out, wanting to connect to my Okrawa, I'm connecting to Manano Mensamanfo, things were revealed to me that I had gathered bits and pieces of along the journey that now finally had the proper context. And as I was doing that self-work, um, ideas and manifestations began to form. You know, wanting to start a business, I'd been working to, to start a business and have always been entrepreneurial-minded, um, but didn't really know how to focus that in the context of spirit. You know, it was very loose, but understanding that my purpose, who I am first with my, my din, knowing that I am a child of Nana Afi, that I am Afia, um, what that means for me, knowing that my ancestry from my matrilineal is Brichuo, investigating that, it gave me the context and it gave me the harmony that I needed to reorganize and structure myself, to purify myself, and then really be in a space of being receptive to listen to what I'm guided to do. Um, and the journey is continuing, you know, because just 
last year, it was Enchanted Pharmacy, and then as I have continued to grow, understanding that Hindu and the medicine, it's it's Hoodoo Pharmacy, it's Hindu Pharmacy. Um, so, it's really it's not a, a straight and narrow path, but the defining moment is is when I came into knowledge of our African ancestral culture and religion because it puts so many things in, into context that I had been drawn to naturally, but that didn't have the context and the proper harmony and and sanity of African ancestral culture and religion. And from doing that work at Mayan Komre and connecting with Manano Mensamafo, um, it just began to open doors that I, I wasn't able to open alone because I was not in a harmonious place. So aligning um, with my Okrawa and doing that ritual work led me on the path to understand more of what my place is and how to receive and listen to what I am to do to make it manifest. Absolutely. And I think that the important piece, one of the key things you said is you were having experiences already, so then when you mm-hmm. came in contact with the infrastructure, which is the right. ancestral religious culture, it simply was able to contextualize what you already had. So you didn't, you didn't receive these things just by coming to our site, but you already had the communication, the spiritual link, but now, through our own culture, you can contextualize the things you've been experiencing from since you were young. So, so what kind of spiritual experiences, right. just like in general, were you having, you know, ever since you were younger that the put child, you well, in that mindset of trying to find out more? Well, when I, when I was, a, especially as a young child, um, I was able to see spirits. You know, I was able to see and hear spirits. And um, at first, that wasn't a scary thing for me, but as I grew Again, not having that proper context, it became scary because I, I wasn't able to, um, I didn't have counsel in terms of what to do with that. So being able to see and, be, and being very sensitive um, to things has always been there. Being someone that's always interested in nature, that's always been there. Um, I can remember as a child being drawn to rocks, you know, like having my little rock collection, <laughs> um, right. sitting on grass, being able to hear and, and connect with Nana. Um, things have always come to me in dreams, um, and I've always been drawn to uh, putting things together. So I've always been drawn to being able to to see things that are separate and then kind of collage them or form them. Um, and now understanding what that is because of Nana Afi, you know, being one that harmoniously brings things together. But those kind of things have always been there. So being being a seer, um, you know, being visited by spirits, seeing spirits um, that were disordered as well as orderly, um, being someone who's an artist and who's interested in, in science and how things work um, and, and how things can be conjured, you know, how energy can be amplified, how it can be conjured, how it can be transmuted. Those are things that have always been there, um, and I, I've explored that along the path, but it wasn't until I was able to really hear and listen in alignment that a lot of that made sense. I had gathered bits and pieces. And also, especially now with Contra Culture Couture, the visual medicine, the visual endu, because I've always been someone that's drawn, that's written things, that, that has seen and, and felt the power of image. Um, I remember I had this dream when I was younger where I was, um, I was in Comet and... I woke up in the dream, I was in Kemet, and it was like, you know, some Achiwadafo, uh digging or trying to, you know, find something with the typical khaki outfit on or whatever. And um, in the dream, what I heard was, all you have to do is look. They were really, and the, the, the Achiwadafos were trying to decipher, but it was like, all you have to do is look. And as I, you know, took my head from being bowed down to looking up at this glyph, it, it, ignited in light and it opened up. So those kind of messages and those kind of things have always been present in my life, but it wasn't again until, like you said, that infrastructure in that context of African ancestral culture and religion and then understanding my personal place in creation and how that's an extension of my Nanonomenta Mapo and the work that they've done, that put everything into the proper context for me to gain um, more of the tumi or the energy and power of those experiences. Even with the even with the trauma at that time, which was a trauma of having a miscarriage, you know, understanding that through that experience that was a purifying process for me, 
and that part of that led me into doing the healing work of my womb as an afro kaitanic woman, um, and then connecting with my ancestors, my Nanoman Samafu ancestors and ancestresses, who literally came through me to purify me, and but now are, um, they were my children that came through, but how they are now, again, my ancestors and ancestresses. But that purification process was really important, even through, you know, the challenges. Um, and at that time, what seemed like it was very painful, I now see that as an experience and a lesson that was like an initiation. So I've had certain initiations along the way, but it wasn't until my um, my mind or my soul was more purified that I was able to put things in a proper place in terms of, okay, why? Why did this happen? And now what am I supposed to do with that, that endu or that initiation? What was it leading me to? And that's still continuing today. You know, it hasn't stopped. Um, I'm still on that journey very much and, and growth and understanding. No, absolutely, man. I'll say for that, that's, um, and I hope that, you know, puts a laser focus on that reality for people who are, Listening, that we're we come into, we're, we conceive, and when we're born into the world and drawn into the womb, even we are born with that culture, born with that capacity, and then of mm-hmm. course once we're born here and raised in this culture, you know if we're not um, exposed, which the majority of us are not growing up to ancestral religion in a proper context. We have mm-hmm. these experiences, but we're grounded. But once we come in contact with something real, then it you know allows us to contextualize. And in fact, just the fact that you were talking about the imagery and being able to look on the walls and so forth and, and see, and it's interesting because something earlier happened earlier today that uh, reminded me of a specific um, incident that happened, you know, a, a long time ago. But for example, the divinity Awusi, Alsar, mm. called Awusi and Akan, one of the in Akan. Um, I remember him showing me uh, the image of, you know, Alsar on the wall of Kemet and pointing mm-hmm. out that that's him. Now, at that time, a couple of decades ago, nobody was talking about the Akan people came from ancient Nubia and the same deities that the Akan people worship the exact same deities with the same names and so forth. I'd never heard of that. But the Abosom showed me that specific image, and then once I was directed to investigate it, of course I was able to confirm it. But it's the same thing what you're saying is they showed you that we can just look and see because we're engaged in the ritual right. practice already. So we know what's happening when we're looking at these things, whereas the Achiwadi for the white neural spring, the spirits of disorder, they can pick and prod and excavate and everything else and only glean certain basic elements of things that they've read or heard from something that we gave out. But that imagery right. you also mentioned, which is very powerful, if, if you could just describe, you know, briefly, one of the most powerful images I've seen or ever seen is the image that you use for Hoover Pharmacy, which is the image we use for the show. It's the image that people will see on the website when they first, you know, pull it up. So mm-hmm. if you can give just a basic breakdown of, of you know, the elements that went into that. So it's the sister on the front. She has a horn. She has a disc over her head. She has a number of different things. So so what what are you um, conveying with that image so people can put it in context? Okay. Well, one is a tribute. Um, that image is an honor to Maya Okrawa, to Nana Afi, to Heteru, um, and also to my Nana Noman Samafo. So just to say... So the Okrawa is what? For the people Say who are unaware. Oh, my Okrawa is so my... So for the people who are unaware? My, my Okrawa is my soul. It's the, the goddess, the deity that is on my crown, um, Heteru. So that is, that is, in some cases, people call it your spiritual mother. Um, that is who, me being, a, being born on Friday um, and being a female born on Friday... That, has, that is an indication of who directly I relate to in terms of my soul. The piece of my soul that I have is a child of Nana Afi, or Heteru, um, who is, you know, the one in Akan who, who harmlessly brings and puts things together. She's known as Oshun um, in Europe tradition, a uh, goddess of harmony, um, of magnetization, of beauty, of, of inspiration, of art, um, 
sexual attraction or what they misnomer as love in that context. Um, so it's it's a tribute, and, and most if not, most if not all of the images and the creative things that I do, it's like a tribute. I'm giving honor, you know, because I get so excited by the things that I'm able to see. That when I'm in that space, whether I'm drawing or I'm on the computer and I'm collaging, it's like it's communication. So it's a way for me to express and to give thanks and gratitude to Nana Afi, you know, to to the deity who is on my crown, who allows me to have access to these visions. Um, I get excited. I kind of geek about it. I get excited about it because of the things that I'm able to witness and to experience. So that image is, is tribute to her. Um, so the horns, you see the woman who, she, it's a woman who has horns and then she has a, um, a golden um, womb placed on her forehead. The image is, is like a pendant. It looks like a... a uh, Art Deco pendant, if you will, but that's representative of the womb that's on my crown because of Nana Afi, also her connection to governing the womb. Um, above that, there is a gold disc, I believe, um, that has gems and stones, it sparkles, and that's representative of the Hetheru crown that we see in Kemet. But also within that, there's a silver dime. Um, and that silver dime is tribute to the culture of Hindu and Hudu in terms of protection against enemies, in terms of prosperity and abundance. Um, silver, the power of silver, um, and what silver is known to do, especially in terms of coins and Hudu culture. So that's why that's included in there. And, the, it, and it's kind of a play on words as well because the one dime is like that one. So for me, um, that's part of that one alignment. It's being in alignment with, with, with my Okrawa that one dime, like being in, in harmony with her. Um, she also has other elements. As you look down the image, you see um, there's frankincense and myrrh on either side, of course, representative of the power of those resins, from medicinal to spiritual. I mean, there's so many um, there's so many uses for frankincense and myrrh, but culturally that is a resin, and those are plants that we have used to purify, to cleanse, spiritually, um, for protection, for healing. Um, so those, that's why those are there. There's pine. Um, the pine is, locative, is, is local and locative because of where I, I am in connection to my ancestry. Like I, I'm in Jersey. I'm, I'm in the East Coast. So um, understanding how my ancestry has traveled from the continent to this country um, and then up from the south up to where I am now, in the northern part of this country, pine is something that has been used. It's like one of the local things, um, the local trees that has a lot of power for me and has had a lot of power for my ancestry in terms of healing um, and because it's potency and it's protection as well. There's the lotus, you know, which is representative of, you know, moving through that mud, you know, moving through that mud um, no matter what the obstacle is, no matter what, but the purification and the beauty that can come from such a journey of moving through something that appears to be murky but is so rich with life um, and mineral and power. And above that you have the skull, which is representative of the ancestors, the Nananum and Samapo. Um, there's opal on either side. Um, and then there's also high john, or what we know of as ginger, um, because of the power of, of high john, the conqueror, and, and that significance in hoodoo. And then also there's some rosemary and some more pine and cedar um, because of the, the power of those herbs for me personally and also how they have been used in my own bloodline for healing throughout family. Um, and then there's, you know, there's the color scheme um, because it's part of the, the transformation that I, I have been going through, especially this year and this year being a year of um, Afida or, or Nana Afi, um, has been in really honing in and sharpening um, more of what my focus is. So Hoodoo for the Hood and then Hoodoo Pharmacy, which was a transition from Enchanted Pharmacy, is like the next step in terms of me understanding and aligning more with my purpose. Um, so it's a renewal for me. So that's why the color scheme is like very pastel, but also has some of the, the indigo and the purple because of the richness and the high vibrational frequency of those colors. But the pastels, you know, because of spring, it's, it's a new beginning. And at the time that I was doing this, I'm also with, I'm pregnant, I'm with child. So there's a lot of things in my life right now that um, things have been shed off, but there are new beginnings that are coming as well. Um, so that's what 
you know, that's just a brief synopsis of some of the Im- imagery. Oh, and, and also the cinnamon broom, because, again, the prosperity and abundance and the power of cinnamon, but also the power of the broom in our culture um, to cleanse away. You know, we, there's a tradition of having the broom above your, the broom ab- above your door to ward off negative energy, to keep things clean, um, but also to welcome in prosperity and abundance, too. So those are just some of the elements um, and some of their meaning. Oh man, I said we really appreciate that breakdown. I was just about to ask you about the brooms, and you, <laughs> you, really, you know, <laughs> got to it. So, um, so now, so you mentioned hoodoo for the hood, and of mm-hmm. course, you know, hood is inside hoodoo. But what are you? What is the, you know, deeper meaning for that that phraseology? Hoodoo okay. for the hood. That's the next thing people see on the site. Right. Well, hoodoo for the hood. Um, one, it's a book um, that I'm being led to to script and to write, um, you know, about my personal journey. Um, but hoodoo for the hood, it's like Hindu hoodoo for the hood, you know. Where do we wear a hood? The hood is, is, is our crown. We put the hood over our head. You know, the hood is what covers us. It's what protects, protects us. It's what, um, you know, allows us to be stealthy, allows us to be um, hidden, unseen, so there's that aspect, but it's also that which is covering, crowning, and protecting us. Um, and also, uh, one of the, another deeper level in terms of being an Afrokai knit, the hood or the seat of power that we um, are thrown, if you will, our um, our womb space, that hood. It's like what we are birthed into. You know, our hood also being that which births generations, literally. So you know, it's the covering. Um, it's the hood in terms of, you know, how the colloquial term of the hood being where we at. Like, I, you know, I, I was born in North Philly, so the hood, if you will, like that's part of where I was born in that sense in terms of that term. But the deeper meaning of that is it's our covering. Hoodoo is the thing that covers us. It is the thing that protects us. It is the lifestyle that, that we live that allows us to move behind enemy lines in such a way that we're able to execute um and still be able to function harmoniously. Yes, and that's a powerful representation. We appreciate the fact that you, you know, contextualize it in that way, so people are really going to benefit from that that publication. I can't wait for it to come out. Um, <laughs> no, and that's I, also, <laughs> hey, because it's going to help to, yeah. it's really going to help to put a, you know, a greater focus on the work we're doing. You, you mentioned the, the year of um, Afi, or Heheru, he, he, and mm-hmm. for, for those who are unaware, so we, this is for us, this is the year 13,018, or we, we start a year in the Akan tradition on the continent, but also specifically here, we start the new year at the, the harvest time, it's also the seeding time, so our new year is calibrated towards the uh, autumn equinox, which is this year was September 22nd. So that was the first day of our new year, 13,018, and it began on a fida, the day of Afi, the day of Heheru. So that energy of not Afi or Heheru governs this entire year. So Afi was speaking to that. One thing before we get into the Atuman, you have a number of images of the Oseba, the leopard, so what is the representation there for the Asaba of the leopard? Well, that, um, that is the totem from my matrilineal clan. Um, so, you know, being, being brave and being fierce, um, as I'm understanding and coming into my understanding of that, being my matrilineal totem and my matrilineal lineage. And speaking, you know, we spoke earlier about things that we see in childhood and, like, you know, my great-grandma... And, again, I never put any of this together um, until it came into context in terms of ancestral culture and religion, but my great-grandma used to have these two huge cats in her house near these um, columns. And as a child, it would scare me. It's like, why do you have these, like, you know, Gigi, why do you have these porcelain, you know, these porcelain cats? And she would always say, well, they're, they protect the house. You know, they're the, protect, the protectors of the house. Um, and they just little things in terms of seeing that those images of cats, leopards, Jaguars in my family, especially within the the women, the matrilineal lineage of my family, um, you know, to receiving 
several times receiving fabric that was leopard print, you know, from aunts and my mom and grandma and things like that. Um, but as I was, you know, at that space where I was moving through understanding, okay, you know, asking and inquiring about, you know, what is my what is my matrilineal clan, what is my patrilineal clan, and, of course, I'm looking down that list that you put together, and I'm like, okay, wait a minute, the leopard. And then I begin to investigate that, and then I inquire about that, and then I start seeing cats. <laughs> you know, I start seeing cats um, around and uh, as, as answer totems, as answer to those questions, um, and then remembering the power of the cat, the power of that totem here, you know, because I'm not going to see necessarily a leopard here, but I have seen cats, you know, and then I have seen lions and I have seen things like that in terms of and my my family lineage. Um, those are the totems that have been used. So the leopard is my matrilineal totem. That is my clan. That is my bosua. That is the matrilineal family of which um, I have inherited. And that's part of the to me and the energy complex that I utilize and the visual endo, the visual medicine, but also energetically. Um, and I think part of that also in terms of the night, as I understand more of the characteristics about that in terms of not only myself, but the women, those matriarchs in my family, the connection to the evening time, hunting, um, you know, uh, being able to utilize something within the darkness as medicine. Um, you know, I spoke about the experience of, you know, what was a traumatic experience for me and how through ritual, how that, going through that, the medicine that that offered me, um, and it offers many women when they go through a traumatic experience as, such as a loss, but what it does for the soul and how in proper context you understand that that's a, a way of medicine, whether it's because you were you were disobedient and you had to learn or it was something of an initiation either way. Um, you know, so being able to transmute things that dwell in darkness and being able to use that endure or that power for for my crafting um, and for the endure or the medicine that I provide our community. So that's what the leopard represents. Um, it's my my abosua, my matrilineal clan. Absolutely. And, and so and for, for people who are unaware, so we talked about Athea speaking at the Who Do Mind, Who Do Nation Festival, the second annual and, and third annual just this past October. So... Um, we talk about hoodoo. We talk about in the beginning of the show, hoodoo is from the icon term, undu, meaning medicine, from roots, trees, plant life, and so forth. Hoodoo is icon ancestry religion preserved in the blood circles of our icon ancestors and ancestors in North America. Hoodoo does not come from pseudo Native Americans or Europeans or some amalgamation of different African groups who threw things together. Icon people who were forced into the Western Hemisphere, we continue to practice icon religion. And the term undu in our con tradition, we utilize that as the general term for our icon ancestry religion. So people practicing hudu, that originally meant these were icon people, just like people practicing juju, that originally meant they were Yoruba people, people practicing voodoo, ebe and phone people, and so forth. So we maintain the traditions. And part of that process is we have seven musia or matric clans in our con culture, all Akan people are descended from one of those seven clans, and the Brito clan, the animal you no know, totem, the major Achinebua animal totem, is Osebo, the leopard. And as Althea was saying, we may not see leopards, you know, roaming around in North America, but those representations of certain kinds of cats, they carry that same feline energy and that same tumi power of the leopard and so forth. So that's the animal totem as it manifests in the Western Hemisphere. So those of us who are in our Akan tradition, the Hoodoo tradition, which is the Akan tradition, we're led, as Afia was talking about, to our to um, evidence of what our matric clans are because we're, you know, we're connected to them pre-incarnation. So we just wanted to bring that out for people who are unfamiliar. But even outside of the Akan tradition, you know, the various different groups, Yoruba, Igbo, wherever we come from, we have animal totems, we have clans and so forth, and that same process is true. When you communicate with your ancestresses and ancestors, they will remind you of who you are, what clan you come from, what animal totems are associated with that, what plant totems, mineral totems, and so forth. They will give you that information. They will communicate with you at your ancestral shrine and other places in, in your own ancestral language so you can hear them 
speaking and so forth, whether it's at the shrine or in a dream or a combination thereof. So they will give us that information and remind us. And then your own cry, your soul, your order inu, your selido and so forth will, of course, give you that information as well. So we just wanted to point that out. But we appreciate your representation of that, your detailed analysis of that so people can really begin to understand. So we want to get into the first section. You're talking about atsumai, which are talismans and amulets. This is part of the service that you provide, the products that you provide. So Mm -hmm. what are the atsumai? And when people are, you know, come to you for atsumai, which is an icon term for talismans and amulets, what's What's taking place? Well, um, the the Osman and talismans are that's that was my start um, in terms of connecting with um, mineral life, plant life, animal life, and being able to um, pull things together. You know, whether it was mud, clay, crystals, herbs, and then um, you know impregnate them, as you would say, or, or 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 birth them, or create them to be an actual house or a shrine of deity. Um, so that's one of the first things that I was led to on this journey in terms of um, Hindu, because that's something that I was all, I was naturally drawn always to stones, crystals, minerals, and clay. Um, so then as I was, you know, was growing, um, I, it was just natural for me to see and to, to feel, really, um, how these things moved and operated together in a way where then they became a unit of power or a house or a seat of power. So when a client comes to me, it's for many different reasons. Um, sometimes a, a person or in a community will come to me because they want a fertility asaman or talisman, and that has a very specific set of herbs, um, rituals, prayer, or energy um, that goes into that talisman. You know, I use, for me, I use, one of the main things I use is clay um, because the clay is able to, just like asazia fuwa, niasazia, is able to hold um, and it can be impregnated with things. So it's able to wrap itself around to hold and to house, um, you know, the minerals, the resins, and those things. And it's just something that I've always naturally gravitated to. So a client will come to me. Um, they might have something in mind already that they want something, again, for fertility or protection, or they might not even know. They might say, you know, I've been, I was drawn to, to um, you know, to inquire with you about, you know, a, a talisman or asaman. So I will go to my Nkomre, and I will do Adibisa, and I will inquire, you know, what is it that this client needs? And sometimes that happens in the call. That will happen in the consultation. As I'm speaking with the person um, and I'm, I'm going through the consultation, I'm hearing things. They're speaking to me and sharing things with me, but then it's like, you know, that whisper. I'm getting a whispering um, of, okay, write this down, or, you know, uh, an herb or a crystal or a remedy or, or an image will come to me as I'm speaking with them, and I log it. I write that down, and then I take that information to Nkomre, um and then inquire what is it that they need. And then from that, sometimes I'll do a specific ad debisa in the method that I use, um, and then I will begin to, you know, formulate what it is that they need. Sometimes I will just create that for them. There's that process where it just will be created as my Nananum and Samanfo and the um, – you know, the abosum and my okrawa work through me, and then sometimes I come up with what I received, and then I share it with them, see if it resonates, and then I begin the creation of their asuman or their shrine piece. Um, so it's many, it really depends on the, the energy that the client has and what they're looking for, although the basics of my process are the same. You know, as soon as I get that call, I'm listening, I'm, I'm, I'm opening to receive, I'm in that space because that's part of my function. So I'm, I'm listening to hear um, what is it? Like, what's underneath? What is it that they need? What, what is it that I am supposed to be receiving from the communication? Um, and then I take that to Nkomre, and from there um, I receive more, and then, you know, I either speak with them and, and ask them, does it, you know, how does that resonate with them? And once I get the okay, then I come back to my Nkomre space, which is also one of my creative workspaces, and I begin to formulate it. You know, I, I do my ritual. Um, I have, you know, all the things that I use, the resins and herbs and everything in here, and I begin that process of impreg- impregnating or creating um, that shrine space. Because it's like I'm, you know, I feel like um, <laughs> when I'm in that space, when it's almost like I feel like I'm architecting, even though I, the energy is working through me. It's like I'm able to get into that mode where I'm, I'm architecting and I'm um, I'm fully present, 
but the energy is moving through. So it's in addition to it being something that is beneficial to the client or the person of community that's coming to me, it's also healing for me to be able to do that work because I'm able to function. I'm able to do what I'm here to do. So I'm able to be in that space of, um, if you will, meditation or trance where I'm able to just flow and infuse, craft, create, invoke, and then form what forms. Sometimes what comes out after the consultation, it's not necessarily what I I imagined it would be um, or what the client imagined that it would be, but it's what they needed. And, you know, I had to get over a process. There was a time and period when I was still having some resistance, like, well, I don't know, this isn't what we spoke about. You know, it it really is about trusting the guidance that I'm given in terms of the Nananoma Samafo and Maya Krawa because, you know, sometimes my... And if you will, my ego or, or whatever that, that voice is of insecurity would get in the way. Well, this isn't what we spoke about, you know. I had to really get over that process and allow um, the energy to flow. So even if it's not initially um, what I thought it would be, it's always what the clients need. Um, so that's been a, a, a pro- for me, that's part of that process has been a process of, of purification and trusting, you know, tr- um, as I'm moving more into the fulfillment of my, my, um, my Krabia and Shan Shabia. No, I, I appreciate that because that's um, it's important to know that number one, it's, so you start off with that consultation. They mm-hmm. share with you what they need, or sharing with you what's going on, and then you can attune to what they need. You begin that process, and when you talk about going to the encombre, which is a, a, is a term for shrine in the Akan language and you engage the adebisa process, as we said, divination, and, it's, it's, and then you engage, you begin the, the crafting. It's all mm-hmm. a creative process guided by the abosom and not a normal amount for the days and that such spirits, as opposed to just being a technician, just being someone who, you know, makes up some jewelry, makes up some amulets, puts them on a shelf, and says, you know, puts some prices on them, says, hey, this is protection and this is for this and this is for that. It's always a dynamic, creative process, and that's that's real, that's authentic ancestry religion. That's the real, the real deal. I shame. So hold on one second. I just want to make sure. So as part of this process, as people are listening, you can, you can if you have any questions or comments for our guests, for our fear, you can hit the number one on the phone line. You can post questions. You can do that now. You can post questions uh, in the chat room. When you go to the site, you can patronize Afia's business right now. You can go to the site. You can, you know, connect with her for talismans, amulets, asumine, and so forth, and a number of different products as well. So we're just starting off with that. But if you have any questions, just hit the number one, and we can answer questions. Um, so the next piece, and you you have, I'll say here on the website, roots, sticks, stones, bones, skins, and clay. So you're using a number of different, you know, um, elements to pull together. Talismans, I know you were, again, using leather as well, um, mm-hmm. which is skin, and you talked about clay a little bit. So so some of those different elements, what, what are the significance when you're when you're crafting, you're being led by the Abosom, by the I don't know small for the deities and your ancestral spirits. What significance do they place on, for example, the bones as well as skins or stones or clay and so forth? Mhm. Well, each um, each element has its own energy, um, has its own its own force of life, um, because it in itself, you know, everything in creation is the shrine. For, for something um, So each element has its own energy The transition from working with the clay To leather um, Which you know usually I'll do a combination Now of a, of a clay asuman Along with um, leather Or a leather indu bag or something Of that nature um, That came about more so recently As I was connecting with my uh, My nananom and samanfo You know I've been wanting to and, and started seeing visions of like you know leather and do bags and but I, I didn't really I didn't uh, move forward in that but I kept feeling this pressure like you know you need to get this material this is the material you, you, you need to work with now and it needs to be leather and it needs to be calf so that was 
I was more prompted from that from my Nana no Mensa Mosco, and also that's another tribute in terms of my Okrawa, in terms of the energy of Heteru, the, the divine calf. Um, but my also my great grandmother was a seamstress, so she she would make <laughs> she would make clothes for the family, you know, prom dresses, shirts, things like that. So as I began to also deepen my connection with her in terms of um, you know ritual work and and she, ever since she's made transition, she's been in, you know in my dreams and even before when and in, in this incarnation when she was still here, she's been a guide to me and that only increased and amplified when she transitioned. Um, as an ancestress, but she was guiding me to start using stitch, like to stitch things, um, because that's another way of putting them together. And then uh, another thing, just in terms of how, just the divine plan of everything, when I began to do the research in terms of her da, she's also feet are born. So I was like, okay, Gigi. Okay. <laughs> like, okay, I see. So right. um, the leather, you know, um, is a tribute and connection to also the divine calf. Um, the house that's holding things, that the house that's going to hold the medicine in terms of the Indu bags, but it's also connected to, um, you know, one of my ancestresses who was a seamstress who was who was guiding me to connect with the the energy of threading, you know, of piercing something, piercing, piercing through and threading in order to stitch and bind something together so that it's useful and that it's a place of harmony um, for adornment. So that's just a little bit about, you know, why the leather... Um, has been a material that I've utilized. The, you know, stones and crystals, you know, that's for, for a pretty obvious reason, just in terms of all the different minerals um, and their composition coming from Asazifu and the Asazia. Um, you know, the actual, in addition to the minerals and their, their uh, you know, some people call them esoteric or spiritual properties, how the actual minerals, um, the endu of the minerals that are in these particular the gems or stones, because the minerals, you know, one, we are mineral life, and the mineral is where part of the power is. So a, a, a gem formulation, as I like to call it, is like a prescription, you know, and the placement on the body where it's being placed is part of the prescription as well. So certain stones or crystals, um, they come in because of their mineral content, you know, along with the color, which is a part of and a reflection of the mineral content that they hold. And I always, for some reason, I also think of stones and crystals as bones as well, um, you know, because they're from a size before. So I think of them as being something that's like an ancient, an ancient bone or relic of the earth. Um, and the and the actual bones, like um, calf bones and things of that nature, again, that that energy, that totem, that animal is a shrine. So depending upon what the client will need or what I'm guided to uh, navigate toward or work to it's because of the energy complex of that particular animal um, and what that particular animal with that endo or that medicine is going to open up or connect with in terms of the client. Um, and what, what energies will it bring to them? Um, because when we wear these things, they're interacting with our melanin. They're interacting with our skin. When we wear a talisman, um, it's not just something that's sitting on us. Like one, yes, it's entering into our auric field, but you're literally wearing this on your skin. It's like the largest organ, so... Everything that is composed, you know, within that talisman, you're absorbing. And when you wear it on your skin continuously, it's being absorbed readily into your 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 bloodstream, your skin, your your body. So you have that auric function of protection as well. But then you have that very literal skin to skin embrace or contact. No, made off it. No, we appreciate that. That's that's a very um, you know, detailed breakdown. We don't we don't always get you know, really the technology behind these things. So I really appreciate you, you know, expounding on that. Us. And also the so and the other piece, the sticks or the the wood. What's mm-hmm. the significance when you're crafting with regard to the wood? Well, that, again, that, it depends on the type of wood, because <laughs> it's, it's so many. This, you know, the earth is a size of food, and it's such as abundant with wood, with all these things. But um, a lot of times, I've, I've, what I have come across is wood as being something that's very grounding. Um, wow. in, in my experience, you know, how I've utilized woods is, is a grounding aspect, and it's also like, you know, it's like a foot or an anchor. Um, but again, it depends on the particular property of that wood. Um, because there's so many different kinds of woods that can be used 
and each one, even though they may all be wood and they may all have a grounding function and a connection in terms of roots, a root system that's embedded in the earth that is also reaching towards, you know, the sky, each one has its own energy complex. So it depends upon what the client is needing, what I'm guided to utilize, and then what the energetic, excuse me, mineral um, life properties of that particular wood are. And it varies, you know. It's it's so there's so much abundance. Like it's so much abundance in the materials that um we have here, you know, that are just naturally around us. There's so much abundance in terms of the use, um, and the properties. And a lot of times which is fine too, like a lot of times we get we, we get acclimated to a specific set of things that a specific set of resins or herbs that are prescribed but there's so much abundance, there's so many different ways that you can interact and engage with materials, whether it be wood, stone, crystal, rock, um, or skin, you know. So it really depends. But the wood for me is something that's anchoring and grounding because of its root system. So it's something that's rooted within Asazia, Fu, and Asazia, the place that it's rooted in, um, you know, the age of that particular tree or the root, um, its location, you know, what the properties are, there's so many different things to consider. So it's like case-by-case basis. Yes. So, so Medase, we appreciate that that breakdown. I I just wanted to read something from your site so people can, you know, get a synopsis of that. You say Mm -hmm. on the section it says soul mission each day. And this is for people who are understanding the talismans, the amulets, whether it's bags, whether it's earrings, whether it's necklaces, whether it's um, pouches, these different things that I see at crafts. She says on the website, I build shrines, sacred adornments and healing tools that replenish the beauty and vitality of Inyame, Inyame Wa which means the supreme being's divine order, uniting harmoniously elements, and energies for the growth and propagation of the Afurakani Afurakaidi nation. So you can go to the website, you can see the different adornments, you can see the different amulets, talismans, and so forth, um, and you can purchase them, you can set up a consultation, you can do that right now. This is, this is the business of the week, Star of the Beast, Feed the Pride. So... Um, one more question before we have a couple of calls. One more question I want to ask just to uh, touch on the you, – you have some images here. I don't want to – I want to pull it up real quick mm-hmm. with regard to the, the plant life, with regard to making certain medicines, but also dealing with the, the wands, the purifying wands, the sage, the smudging, and so forth. What do you Mm -hmm. utilize with regard to that? Um, Well, the basic set that I use are what things that naturally are around me um, and things that I'm drawn to. For example, roses. Um, You know, my great-grandmother loved roses. Um, She would wear rose oil. Um, So I have a connection to that from one of my ancestors, but also the, the property of roses in terms of their vibration, their power, their beauty. So a lot of times I will use rose, um, along with other flowers, um, there's a, I think it's called Leatris. Um, it's a purple flower. Is another one that I use. Yarrow, um, sometimes baby's breath. Um, you know, pine, sage, rosemary. Um, again, it depends on what the the what it's going to be used for, um, because there are so many ways to purify and clear and cleanse a space. You know, more than just the traditional st- sage, which I use too. <laughs> Um, so there's a combination. Again, these things are like prescriptions. It's a formula. So there might be a, a wand that might have some bark, you know, pine, because um, I work to use what is what is naturally around me, and I'm in a northern area. So I can collect my own pine bark. I can collect my own pine. Um, you know, for, when, seasonally I can c- collect my own yarrow. Um, some things I will purchase, but mostly I, I work to try to collect my own um, herbs, if I can, based upon where I'm located. Um, so, yeah, things that are local to me are, are you know, pines, um, yarrow, um, the, the Leatrice, I believe the name is. I, I'm not 100% sure if I have the right name. Um, but things that grow around me, 
um, and the things that you know I purchase or that I know the the quality of I know that my ancestors use um, linden flower rosemary um, there's so many <laughs> golden rod um, so there's they're, they're formulas so based upon what a client will want if they want something that's just going to be strongly purifying then I'll have you know I might have a sage bundle I might have some pine um, some pine bark some cypress and then sometimes I will coat them like they'll be coated in oil they might be coated in in a and a high john oil, or they might be coated in, for example, frankincense and myrrh oil um, to do a, a particular combination. But it's a formula, so it depends upon what the client is needing or what I'm drawn to, what's in season, what I'm guided to use. Um, but the herbal bundles or wands are for purification. They're for you to, to one, you know, you sit them on your shrine or your encomre so that they dry because I do them fresh. So when the client receives them, a lot of times there's still, there's still some moisture there. Um, you sit them in a sacred space where you want to have that energy infused and you allow that energy to dry. And as it's drying, that energy is, you know, diffusing itself into the environment. And then once they're dry or you feel they're ready, then you add that element of fire to it um, to burn so that that, that fire and then that, that herb come together and then create that infusion of that smoke and you take through your space or over your person or over the object that you want to consecrate or to sanctify. Um, but it's a formula, so it depends upon what the client is wanting and what energy they're wanting to utilize or what the situation calls for. And I'll say, and, and so and when people look on the site, you, you'll, see, um, you'll see an image of a field, you know, Crafting these, there it says right on the site, handcrafted herbal and floral smudge wands. So you don't have to go get pseudo Native American, you know, <laughs> sage wands from uh, Whole Foods or something. You can get, <laughs> you know, handcrafted herbal and floral smudge wands directly from Afia for purification, sanctification, beautification of your space, and for other ritual purposes in there tailored specifically, ritually prescripted for your specific needs when you connect with Afia through the website, connecting with her and so forth. So you can go to the website and make those purchases. Um, so you want to take a couple of phone calls? You want to take a couple of phone calls? Sure. <laughs> sure. Yes, I will, my, my introverted okay. self can, can take a few. <laughs> All right, so um, we'll take a couple of phone calls, and then we want to get to also want to talk about the conjure culture and couture. But first, we want to take a couple of phone calls. So on the phone line, Michi, I will number 3558. You have a question or a comment for our guest? Michi, on the phone line, number 3558. Okay, it was ending. You got me confused for a second. Sorry. Are, are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. Hatep. I'm Nefera. Um, calling from Toronto, Hatep. Canada. Are you hearing me? Mm-hmm. Right. Yes, Hatep. How are you doing? All right. Okay, I'm calling from Toronto, Canada, and... I um, came into the show a little late, so I don't know if my question was answered already or um, if you discussed it already. Um, What I wanted to know, um, Sister, is is if your work requires, if if someone's interested in getting a talisman, does your work require the client to be present in front of you, or do you do these things over the phone? Do you um, deliver internationally? Well, the client doesn't ha- – I, I do consultations by phone. Um, if I can okay. do a personal consultation, I will, if I have the person in front of me. Um, but mostly um, I will get a phone call or I'll get an inquiry online, and then I will make the, the phone call to do the consultation. And all of the consultations, by the way, all of my consultations are free. Um, so any okay. any call or any consultation I have is free. Um, okay. So let me get this clear. So um, – if I wanted a consultation, I would go online first and contact you that way, and you would call me back. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you do and you do deliver internationally if I needed a talisman for certain work. 
Yes, you deliver I do. Internationally. I do deliver internationally. The only thing is that there will be um, the shipping would be a little bit more because of the you know the fees for shipping. But yes, um, one of my clients, um, who I did a a, a Caracasa talisman for was from Jamaica. So I do do international oh, shipping. Mhm. Okay, well, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you so much, and um, thanks for the information. It was very informative. And, um, oh, let us know. Yeah, right, right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, let us say We appreciate that call. So we do have that. You do have the international shipping option, so we're going to go to the next uh, phone call. Hold on one second. Uh, Michelle, we're on the phone line, number 3011. You had a question or a comment for our guest? Michelle, number 3011. Michelle, no, 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 see. Michelle, no. Michelle, Michelle, Quasi. I was asking about uh, for that. I was asking about the um the jewelry, some of the jewelry that you uh, are wearing. I was asking where do you do the piercing or did you do the piercing or, or was that after that you came to, <clears throat> that you realized into the culture that you go somewhere else to get the piercing? Mhm. The nose okay. piercing. Mhm. Um, I did not do the piercing myself, but that's part of the the journey in terms of being drawn to being drawn to receive certain marks um, or things of initiation or certain uh, certain etchings, if you will, on my body and at particular places. I was guided to do that, um, and then later on found uh, you know why I understood why. Um, so I didn't do the piercing myself. Okay. Um, for, but if I was to do another piercing today, I would. <laughs> I would, unless I knew the person and I had a a rapport with them, um, you know. But if I was to do my own, if I was to get another piercing somewhere, I would be doing it myself. Mm. Okay, Meta I say. Any I say that? Okay, Meta I say we appreciate that phone call. And uh, just briefly, could you you expound a little bit about, you talked about the piercing in the context of certain regions of the body and why you were directed towards those regions. Mm -hmm. What was the context for that? Well, a lot like the librette that I have, uh, which is the piercing that's right underneath um, the bottom lip, you know, we see that traditionally. Um, on many women, at the time that I got it done, I didn't have that those images. You know, I didn't have that knowledge, but I was drawn. I was drawn very strongly to mark that part of my body. And at that time, um, part of it was like my speech. You know, wanting my words, wanting what comes out of my mouth to be clear, um, wanting it to have focus, to be clear, and to be beautiful. So that was the the, the process of my own thinking at that time when I got it done. Um, you know, at that particular spot. Um, the nose, you know, that I got my um, septum pierced. That was actually as I, 2015, around that time when I was moving into um, more ancestral culture and religion, and that was directly connected to my Okrawa and to the sacred bull. Um, so that's why I have that one um, there in particular. And then the one that's on my left nostril, um, that was... It's kind of personal in a sense, but it was like I w- that was a, a reclaiming. That was a reclaiming of myself and my, my, my body. It was a reclaiming of my space, my sacred space in terms of my body temple. Um, and then later I began to understand also how even, you know, cer- the certain places that we get piercings because of the meridians and the ley lines, how they have effect medicinally on the body, and then understanding that um, on the nostril, particular nostril, um, it's believed that it that particular point can also assist and help you with children, like bearing children and birthing, Um, but I discovered that much later, but the reason was for a reclamation. It was like I was working to reclaim certain things, um, and I was guided to get that piercing or that that marking um, 
for a particular reason, although um, it wasn't necessarily at the time I didn't consider it to be ancestral in terms of ancestral culture and religion as I know today, but I was guided to get it done for a particular reason, whether it was beautification, whether it was wanting something to be, um, and, uh, you know, like my speech, wanting that to be clear, wanting my words to have power, to be um, beautiful of light and harmony with the librette. That was the thinking process that I had at the time. But later on, again, as I began to connect deeper to my ancestry and I would look at, you know, these these beautiful African women and my ancestry, I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, I, I see now, I understand now why I was drawn to that particular um, body adornment. And then again, my Krawa, understanding her being the one that is adorned, that is beautifully adorned. So the context came later, um, but I was guided to do certain things. And even though I didn't know why, I, I, I followed what I was guided to. I followed that inner, that intuition, even though I didn't understand it completely at that time. Absolutely, and, that, and that's sense. so key because, <laughs> right? No, it does. It makes perfect sense because you know I'm sure the people in the listening audience have similar experiences where they have that strong inclination in a certain direction. They may not know the details yet, mm-hmm. but that inclination is really coming from their own kra, their own krawa, mm-hmm. soul, the divinity dwelling in the head region, and it's always led them in the proper direction ever since they were children up until this right. moment. So they may not know the specific names or details about the, you know, the direction, but they know it's correct. And then when we follow that direction from that divinity, then it plays out later that we find out the details and exactly why we're doing what we're doing, and it's always on point. And I like what you said about the ley lines in the body, the neck, those meridians. We've been mm-hmm. dealing with that prior to you know people talking about acupuncture and so forth, we've had that right. ritual knowledge for tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, and it's manifest in every aspect of our culture, in the fabric of the culture, with the jewelry and, and, you know, markings on the body and incisions for ritual practices and initiations and so forth. We know exactly where right. to place these things. So we appreciate and you know what? that. One of the, um, oh, I was just going to say one of the strongest no, things, um, it's, not even a, it's not even a piercing, one of the strongest one of the most evident things that I have of that in terms of a marking um, on my body or etching is on my is a tattoo that I have. I got in my early 20s, and I was um, at the time I, I was ex- I was exploring. I was drawn to um, African tradition and culture, but it was through way of voodoo. So I was investigating and connected to a lot of vebes, and at that time, Erzuli's vebe like that. I, you know, every time I would see that veve, it was like, oh, my goodness, something something resonated with me, but I didn't know its connection to Oshun or to Hetaru or to Afi at that time. But I, that's the t- I have a tattoo of that veve on my arm, um, the only tattoo I have. But it wasn't again until later, and I'm like, no, no. <laughs> like, wow, you know, this whole time you, you've been there. You've been guiding me, and um, you've been showing me and revealing me yourself in all your manifestations, you know. So I just wanted to share that because that's one of the most obvious things um, outside of the piercings, that etching, that tattoo that I have in terms of that experience. And, in fact, that's um, – so for people who are unaware, so Erzuli in Voodoo, Voodoo in North America and Louisiana and so forth and Voodoo in Haiti and so forth, um, Erzuli is Azili, which is – that is Hetheru in the Voodoo tradition – She's Hetheru in ancient Kemet. She's Oshun in the Yoruba tradition. She's Afi. And she's also called Cheche in Akan. She's, she's called Afi. And Cheche in Akan, Hethe in ancient Kemet, Hetheru. And Afi is the title of Hetheru in ancient Kemet as well. Fai or Feet. She's called Afi in Akan, Feet in ancient Kemet. But that Erzuli Veve. Um, now, the one that you have is it similar to, like, some of them look kind of like the Sankofa symbol. With an extra, right. it's um. Right. So. It, mm-hmm. Oh no! Go ahead. It's yes, it is. It's the one that has the the heart with the graph inside, and then yes, the the extended arms out. You know, with the um, right. kind of like the umbrella top with the moons. That's the one that I have on my my left shoulder. Okay. 
So that's, and so that just brings things together. So Erzuli is, so if you were investigating, you were investigating ancestral religion and what you were able to come in contact with at that particular time was the mm-hmm. Vodun tradition. But the same force in nature that Fon and Ebe people call Erzuli, your ancestors is an ancestor, and of course mine, call Afi. So right. she drew you to a ceremony where she was operating all the people there called her Erzuli, but she knows that you would call her Afi, so she drew you to her, even though you were in a different, you know, ethnic group's, you know, mm-hmm. um, practice or expression. But she's the same divinity, so she allowed you to stamp her symbol on you. And, of course, in our Khan culture, that symbol is an Erzuli Veve, but it includes that Sankofa symbol. And, of course, that uh, Sankofa nice. symbol within the symbol is the fallopian tubes where the conception takes place and the return takes place. So she's right there the whole time. <laughs> so it's a way that, you know, it's a cross-cultural thing, but she made her presence felt even before, you know, you were able to contextualize it, but she was always working. And you were receptive enough to say, you know what, I need to do exactly what she's directing me to do. So it's a perfect mm-hmm. situation. Um, okay, so we're going to take another call on the phone line. I'm a GOO, number 2081. Yes, yes, crazy. Good evening, and good evening What's up? Um, to the guests. Well, um, one question in regards to totems. The totems that you sell, are they arranged in varieties, like from crystals to rocks to stainless steel. Are they like shaped into symbols or certain situations in these type of elements? The totems that you carry. Um. My, the personal. Well, could you could you elaborate on your question? Are you saying well, that? Well, like like say like certain totems. I'm not sure what the average totem normally looks like. From what I see, it could be a shape in a like a shape image, like a symbol, mm-hmm. from a like stainless steel or copper, or it could be like a rock form, or right. maybe crystal could be totem. That's what I'm kind of asking. Okay, so just so that I understand, are you asking if a particular um, metal or mineral, um, do I yeah, carry some that varies. have? Yes, yeah, does it vary from certain totems? Or does yeah, like only... um, mm-hmm. if, yes, if you're asking if what, what I personally carry, whether it's stones or crystals, if the shape of them vary or the energy of them varies at yes, particular yes. points, yeah, it does, you know, because these things are living um, as I'm living, so as as I'm, and as we're living, so particular, whether it's a stone or a piece of metal, particular things on your journey that may um, be in alignment with you or in harmony with you at a particular time, as you're growing, growing and going through your um, purification process, your growth process, you know some things you you have, but then you you that changes as you're evolving. So there are stones that I have that I've had for years that I might not necessarily carry on me at a particular time because of the energy that I'm moving through. Um, mm-hmm. Or even, a, and, and since you said totems, there are even animals, yes, that I may see or that that may come to me um, in the world or in dreams that come to me at a particular time, but then that energy might shift or change depending upon where I'm at, you know, what I'm meant to see, what I'm meant to discover, because it's all communication. You know, these these living entities and energies are communicating with us. So there are some that have been with me, and then there are some that change depending upon where I'm at in my journey um, or where we're at at our journey at a particular time, you know, because we're, we're constantly moving. Um, if, does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it answers it. Um, okay. All right, then I think I have no other questions. Thank you very much. Any I say that? Okay, made out that we appreciate the call, and we do want to get into, so we're talking about their talismans, amulets, asumine is a common term, talismans, amulets, and so forth, the Afia crafts, um, there's international shipping, of course, as well, the the smudges, the, um, you know, wands for smudging and so forth, purification, sanctification, and so forth, um, the jewelry, a number of different products, um, all based on ritual prescription, based on what you need, the point you are in your life, consultation, 
brings that out, consultation with you, of course, consultation at the Nkomre, the shrine with the with Adebisa through the agency of Adebisa or Divination, spiritual inquiry and so forth to craft exactly what you need specifically for you. Um, so you can go to the website now, patronize the business, please do that. Um, but then we want to talk about the other piece, which is um, kind of a new manifestation, something recent over the past few months that you've brought forth, that you've birthed, of course, conceived and birthed. So it's the conjure, culture, couture. You have a clothing line, adults as well as children, as well as babies, dealing with mm-hmm. the tradition and so forth. So people can order those shirts for the babies, as even infants, as well as, you know, adults and so forth. So how did the conjure, culture, couture come about? Well, that um, that came about, you know, in, the, in alignment with um, Hoodoo Pharmacy in terms of its rebirthing and then Hoodoo for the Hood. You know, I've always wanted to and been drawn to design things. Um, and, again, with the images, you know, uh, putting images together. And I've, I've, I've done a lot of visual arts, a lot of collages and, and things like that, and um, understanding the power of images, particularly for us. Africani, Africani, meet how images, the power of images in terms of our knee or our eye, um, what we see, how that, how that has power to shape our reality, to shape our focus, um, and to be a point of, of, a portal, if you will, a point of manifestation, but also a, a portal into a particular energy because of the shrine of that image. Um, so a couple of months ago, you know, I was sitting um, and speaking with um, my kunu, my husband, Yawu, um, and we had been wanting to, you know, work and, and, and form and create things using a dinkras, um, whether that be shirts, clothing, bags. Um, that's something that we've been talking about. Um, and we, we, you know, drew things up, wrote things out, but it wasn't the right time. And that's a lot of uh, – the other thing, and, and too, in terms of the entrepreneurship and the ideas, is like an idea might come, but it might not be that time to birth it or to bring it into – uh, manifestation. So, you know, we might have that conversation in terms of what we're working to create or what we feel we're guided to um, to create an idea that comes, but it might not be the right time. So a couple of months ago, you know, we were having a conversation in terms of, you know, what's next or where we feel guided to go. And then, you know, the shirt. Oh, actually, also, <laughs> you, um, because of the the black swan, you know, the, the black swan shirts, um, and that connection as well in terms of being asked to to design, to actually design something too. So uh, all these things were working together, you know, these synchronicities. Um, and it was like, you know what, this is the time now. Like now, you know, go forward and, you know, utilize um, these images that you're seeing, these things that are coming to you, put them together, and now is the time where you can, you can birth that and put that out. So I felt comfortable. I felt like now was the, the right time to move forward with that, and, and we both did. Um, so Conjure Culture Couture came, and the name, you know, you, when I think about clothing and designs and shirts, it's like I might have an idea, oh, that would be so cool, you know, or I want a shirt like that, but it's like create it, you know. If you want to see that, then you have to create it. So that's part of it as well. And creating images and symbols that are for us, particularly as a calm people in North America, um, you know, adinkras, but also the collages, the imagery, even like the the um, the logo, you know, that's one of the images that's available on a shirt as well. Putting things together, symbols that um, encapsulate and have so much power, um, more so than necessarily a word might, because we're vi- we're visual people. So some people receive things, and, and actually you, Quasi, said this to me, that, you know, people receive things differently. Some people receive things through words. Some people receive things through videos. But then there are others, and on average, it's the visual stimulation. So all of those things combined, um, and it, it informed me, and then I was guided as well to move forward to create Conjure Culture Couture. And, and again, it's like that whisper, because some stuff is like, I, it's not it's not me just making it up. It's like, I heard I heard that, you know, that whisper was, someone was, one of them was whispering, like, you know, Conjure Culture Couture. <laughs> so I was like, what? So I started yeah. writing it down and writing what was, um, you know, that whispering that was coming, and then they just kind of organically um birthed itself, you know, through the right timing, through through listening, through all the synchronicities that were around. And it's really about 
you know, acknowledging the power of the visual world. Because images are frequency, you know, and our our non anonymous semaphore have used image um, forever, basically. You know, we look at commit, like we ha- our, our language is visual. You know, our language is symbols and images. It's, it's those shrines and those portals. Um, and it's also, I think about it as like a visual endu, as visual medicine. Because when we see something that's harmonious or that's beautiful, it can inspire us. It can uplift us. It can make us feel like, yo, you know, whether we're wearing it or we see someone else wearing it, it can spark or ignite something in us that allows us to recall and to remember or sankofa or harmonize. Um, and we can, you know, I get excited about those things, and part of that's just because of my energy complex. But um, it's a, you know, I, I consider it a, a form of art, but also a form of of conjure, and part of our ancestral cultural power. Um, which is why, you know, the the thing that we say with contra culture couture is that hoodoo is our culture, but couture is our style because it's made for us. It's tailored specifically to images of power that will resonate with us as. Um, a con in North America, or those that practice African ancestral culture and religion in North America, you know. But the, a lot of the focus is on, you know, our images and our symbols. Yes, and I, I appreciate the way you said that. That you know, the the symbols are medicinal in and of themselves. It's not just, you know, somebody throwing some images together, you know, and just putting something on a shirt they think might sell. But those geometric forms are literally medicinal and empowering for us when we apprehend them visually and wear them and impacts us spiritually. So that and then and the whole piece about, which is very important, and I'm, I'm sure people can resonate with how you said that um, certain things may be, you may conceive them at some, a certain point, but they're not ready to be birthed until later. So right. We we often think that once the idea comes, we have to get it done at that moment, but it may not be time to birth it. It's just a conception. It has to gestate for a while. And while that's right. gestating, some other thing that was conceived previously may be, may be time for that to be birthed, but the other, the new piece may not be ready yet to be delivered. But when it's the right time, it's the right time. <laughs> so, and, and, for, and when you did mention, so um, Afia is the, person who we worked with to produce the beautiful black swan life image for the shirts and those are coming. We did send out an uh, email about that so earlier this week and we're going to have those coming out, those, those shipments coming out. So, um, so for the Conjure Culture Couture for the, the shirts and for the clothing, that's, so you have the Hoodoo Pharmacies Pharmacy spelled S A R M A C Y on mm-hmm. Facebook, and you'll see the business page, business page for Hoodoo Pharmacy. <clears throat> and when people go, when you go to the page, uh, facebook.com slash Hoodoo for the Hood. So that's the direct link to the Hoodoo Pharmacy page. And when you go to that page, you'll see the information for the direct link to the website, but you also see different images for the t shirts for adults as well as children, as well as, you know, which is <laughs> very appreciative for the babies, for the infants and so forth, mm-hmm. little babies and so forth. So you have a number of different images, a number of different styles and so forth, so people can go to the Hoodoo Pharmacy page, pharmacy spelled with F-A-R-M, um, on Facebook to get those, get that clothing line. We need to adorn ourselves with, you know, the imagery that actually empowers us. We're spending money on shirts with swoosh symbols and Adidas and Nike and, and, you know, all these different images. We're constantly wearing other people's images and paying for them. If we're going to have images on our clothing, those images should actually stimulate our spirits literally to realign ourselves. Every time we see those images, it should cause a realignment of our spirit. Every time you see a swoosh symbol or something else, it doesn't do anything but you know, reinforce and recolonize our minds towards serving, you know, the crackers who put the clothing out. So we need, we've we always used images to empower ourselves. They are literally medicinal, the geometric forms. When you plug your life force energy into certain geometric forms, it causes a resonance that comes back from the form and it affects your spirit in a, in a measurable fashion. So these, these um, symbols on the clothing and the images on the clothing – 
including the colors and the geometric forms in combination, are medicinal. So that's the Hoodoo Pharmacy page on Facebook. And then, of course, the website, asaseyedudu.wixsite.com slash creations. And let me go back to the let me go back to the um, the original link. Well, the original link is on the in the chat room. We placed it in the chat room so everybody can see. And if you scroll up, you'll see um slash creations slash hoodoo dash pharmacy. So um, so actually, it's almost we only got like a few minutes left in the broadcast. So any closing um, words? We, Really appreciate you coming on, but any closing words to the community about the um, business? Well, first and foremost, just met I say, um, you know, to to all the Africani, Africani need that are on their journey, that are listening, that, you know, are working to purify themselves and move into alignment because, you know, we operate as one body. So as I'm doing my work, as you're doing your work, that's how we are meant to heal um, you know, and the things that are being created and that are moving through me um, has been part of my healing. So it's like we each have something to offer. We each have something to to birth and to bring forth. Um, and it's my hope that, you know, what I have shared will inspire um, or uplift or encourage whatever that is, whatever that seed is within you to, to come out, you know, because we each come here with a divine function and purpose. Um, and I just I give tribute to Mara Krawa, I say Merase because, you know, as you were speaking, I I remembered the story of um Tahuti and Hetaru healing the eye, healing the Ani um of Haru, you know, and how image and beauty and things that we see that inspire us, um, how how that is part of our purification, how that is part of our healing. So whether it's from Hoodoo Pharmacy or if it's an, another black owned business that, you know, opens your eyes, you know, your eye, your internal eye, your physical eye, you know, support it um, and, and let it do its healing on you, you know. Move into a space where you're open to that healing because as we all heal um, on an individual level, it's collective. Um, and it takes, you know, it takes work. It's not always pretty, um, but it is beautiful. So Meta, I say for, for listening and allowing me to be a part of tonight's show. Yeah, we really appreciate you. We're honored to have you on. Finally, we had we took a few weeks to get everything together, but we really appreciate you. Um, oh, I'm, I'm one so of our honored. Most, well, hey, you're one of our most brilliant. Um, oh my goodness! Sisters in the community, putting many of us into retirement. So, oh my god, we really appreciate. <laughs> I'm just saying, but no, we really, really appreciate it. Honored by your presence, the work, um, everything you're doing, the healing that you're doing. People just need to really know that there are people like you out here who are really doing work on a consistent basis, need to be supported. So we really appreciate you. Of course, you have an open invitation to come to the show anytime, anything that you want to talk about. You can also come on the OGDA broadcast and talk about, you know, more detail about Nana Afi and so forth. So we we can do that as well. So we really appreciate you, Medase, for coming out. Medase, and I, you know, and I just have to say what I know that many people are thinking too. Medase to you because, you know, a lot of my journey and my healing and me even moving into this space of alignment has come from the work that you're doing consistently. It has come from the broadcast. It has come from the publications. You know, when we speak about like being in alignment, you know, all the time and being exemplary of being in that alignment. You know, Brother Quasi, you really exemplify that, you know, even in terms of your old chin, the sun shining that light out, you know, giving us that communication, um, those messages that we need to receive. Met I say to you um, for all the work that you're doing within the community because it is so needed, it has been so needed, and it's so valuable. Um, and I would not, if, if I did not come into contact with the work that you're doing as you're fulfilling your divine purpose, um, you know, I, the question I could question where would I be now, you know, because because of you doing your work, it has assisted me, and that's what it's about, us moving into alignment so that we can all function and do what we're here to do for each other. So, Meta, I say to you, for all that you are doing for the community on a consistent daily basis. Well, you know, I said I appreciate that, and just so you also know, of course, and people 
also know when we connect like this, and for example, with the Hoodoo Mind Festival, and you came and presented the second annual and the third annual, the work you're doing inspires me as well. So I've been able to have a greater understanding, a uh, much deeper understanding of Nana Afi just by interacting with you. So we all are, you know, learning from each other. So we really appreciate you. So may I say, appreciate it. Okay. Heads up. Talk to you soon. Okay, heads up. Okay. So we're gonna end the broadcast here. Um so please go to the site, go to Afia's site. She's Afia Asase Lotus on Facebook, but also the Hoodoo Pharmacy on Facebook. You of course, you go there, you'll see the connection to the website with, you know, the Asamayin, the talismans, the amulets, the healing wands, the bags, everything. Um, but then you also see the uh, conjure culture couture, so you'll see the clothing line as well. So please go. Starve the beast, feed the pride. Uh, Who do pharmacy is the business of the week, so please support our sister. She's doing great work in the community. She's been doing work in the community for years. This is, of course, why we were honored to have her not only on the show tonight, but to present two years in a row at the Hoodoo Mind, Hoodoo Nation Festival. She'll be back next year as well. So, um, again, yet I'll say for everyone tuning into the broadcast, uh, we do have, once again, our Ka Kaet, the soul of hoodoo and voodoo retreat coming up. Memorial Day weekend in Treme, New Orleans. Myself, as well as Kalinda Laveau, Voodoo Queen Kalinda Laveau, will be conducting those sessions um, that weekend for the Obedima Afrakani Manhood, Obatine Afrakani Womanhood, as well as, as, well as the Patas of Tim, and Hoodoo and Voodoo in the context, Afrakani Manhood and Afrakani Womanhood in the context of Hoodoo and Voodoo and so forth. So, all of that detailed information is on the site for that. Um, Spaces are filling up for the retreat. We only have 25 spaces, just that kind of group. We weren't going to have a, a, like hundreds of people, just a smaller group of 25, very similar to the group that we had um, on Edisto Island in South Carolina a couple of weeks ago when we had our retreat there. So another, you know, a smaller group so we can have in-depth um, training with a smaller group, and sometimes it's better to have a smaller group like that. So... Um, we had 25 spaces. We had immediately five people signed up, and then we had some more people sign up. So we about something like 15 spaces left now uh, for the retreat. So if you would like to reserve a space, please do so as soon as possible. First come, first serve. You can go to the Kakai um, page on our website, on our regular website, ojira.com, as well as you'll see that information as well on our Facebook page, Kwesi Akan on Facebook, Ojira Fo Akan on Facebook, and so forth. If you have any questions, just uh, hit us up. So again, Yerase, we thank you for tuning into the broadcast, and Yebeshi Abio, we will meet again. Hit us up. <laughs>